Morning all. A very interesting tournament is taking place in the United States. The strongest small tournament ever actually played in St. Louis from September 9th to 15th. It has Magnus Carlsen, the number one in the world, Levin Aronian, number two, and two of the top United States players, Hikaru Nakamura and Gata Kamsky. So it's called the Sinkfield Cup and there's some information about Sinkfield. It's not a location, it's I believe uh, after Rex Sinkfield, born 1944, was an American retired financial executive in Missouri politics and philanthropic causes. In 2007, Rex Sinkfield opened the chess club and scholastic center of St. Louis, a non-profit organization, an educational organization. Its mission is to maintain a formal program of instruction to teach the game of chess and to support and promote its educational program through community outreach and local and national partnerships to increase awareness of the educational value of chess. So a very fine mission. And um, okay, this game uh, yesterday, Magnus Carlsen playing white against Kata Kamsky. Let's have a quick look at it, or not so quick as the case may be. So knight f3 from Magnus, and Gata replies with knight f6, and we see c4, the English opening. And now it starts to transpose actually into a Slav defense. Black playing c6, and Magnus replies d4. So now we're in Slav territory. d5, knight c3. And now an interesting uh, move, a6 is played. This is the third most popular choice in this position. If we go back here, e6 I've, in my live book um, is the most played with over uh, 22,000 games. D takes c4 over 11,000 games. Uh, this is approaching 7,000 games, third most popular, and after that it drops off g6, uh, 728. So this is a very viable option, this a6. And Magnus just responds with e3. And we see now uh, the most popular idea for black is actually b5 here with over 2,500 games, making use of that a6 immediately with b5. Uh, the next most popular is e6 with 16, 11 games. Now this next idea is bishop f5 with 352, third most popular move in the position. So bishop f5, and Magnus responds with bishop d3. Another idea is queen b3 to put pressure on b7 here. This is actually the most popular move, queen b3. And play could go rather strangely actually with the most popular move being rook a7. So that looks awkward to defend b7. But on the other hand, there's no bishop d3 now with the, the queen not supporting bishop d3. So how does white proceed? An example uh, continuation like this. And um, there's been a few games played like this, believe it or not, with that weird looking rook on uh, a7. And things get even weirder with bishop b5. That's ignored. It's too dangerous to take that here. Okay, there's some games like that. But uh, okay, no, we see actually after bishop f5, not queen b3, provoking that weirdness, but bishop d3 instead. And this is taken. Lots of games have been played in, in this variation. e6, with 90 games here at least with e6. And now the most common move is actually bishop e7 here, keeping the dark square bishop on, not wanting to exchange for this knight. But uh, this is also popular bishop b4. And bishop b4 is the one that's played. And Magnus responds with bishop d2. Okay, and now we're coming out um, of theory a bit, so let's see what's going on now. Here, black voluntarily took on c3, actually, most people just castle here and not voluntarily give up the bishop. So bishop d2, bishop takes c3, bishop takes c3. So the scene is set. Can this dark square bishop be good in this structure? You'd think with all these pawns on light squares that actually these dark square weaknesses are going to be ripe for this bishop on c3 immediately, for example, this diagonal. But also the bishop can maybe bounce back like this at some point as well. This bishop can be a monster on the dark squares if black's not careful. 
Okay, we see castling and now A4. So A4 prevents B5 and also another purpose of it is A5 can start fixing these pawns on the queen side, trying to immobilize black on the queen side. And in fact, after knight BD7, we see A5. And of course, black doesn't want to liberate with B6, you know, left with a terrible weakness on A6. So black's getting frozen uh, pawns on, on light squares at the moment. And if they're frozen, then this bishop is going to perhaps run riots potentially on the dark squares more easily without liberating breaks from black. But we see knight e4, and the bishop preser preserves itself. Bishop b4 attacking the rook. The rook moves. Rook ac1. And now an odd looking move is played here. I'm going to put on a bit here. I didn't quite get it when I saw it yesterday. Um, not quite really. Uh, what would you play here with the black pieces? Uh, can you guess Gatakamski's next move if I give you uh, 10 seconds starting from now? Okay. He played actually h5. Now, an engine evaluation shift occurs here actually for, for favoring white a bit more. Um, now, in principle, uh, as humans, we can say, well, it's weakening the king side, you know, but how does white actually exploit this? It means also if this knight moves uh, to e5, which, which is viable because the bishop can, can occupy d6 potentially if there's a pawn on e5, it means f3 and g4 might be prevented. So, in a way, it can be seen as prophylaxis of some sort. Uh, that this could be useful prophylaxis potentially uh, against g4, maybe. That's one reason behind it. Um, but another reason, of course, it could be pushed at some point as well, um, which might be useful to try and lock down these pawns, like white has locked down these pawns. Maybe after h3, you know, black wants to lock down on the dark squares. So there's a couple of points to h5, kind of symmetrical idea in a way, but the king here is a bit worrisome that, in theory, we're creating some weaknesses here when we move pawns around our king. Uh, so let's see, knight e5 is played. Magnus doesn't mind at all um, the double pawns here, because the bishop will be supported on d6, I believe. So let's have a quick look. In the game, actually, queen c7 was played, but knight takes e5, d takes. Um, if this knight is evicted first, that would help, and then bishop d6, that might be the, the key uh, idea here. If this did happen, um, let's give an example. Okay, um, a move. Let's have a move. F5, F3. In fact, we don't even need to put the bishop on d6 immediately. Um, in fact, it would be subject to attack with knight f7. Bishop d6, maybe knight f7 at some point. Uh, but I think white enjoys a good position here, nevertheless. This pawn on e5 is quite cramping. It's marking out some key dark squares. So I think this is to be avoided. Okay, so basically we see, instead we see queen c7 attacking the knight. And now we just get this exchange on d7. So leaving this, this bishop versus this knight. But is the knight really evictable with advantage with f3 coming up? Well, for a moment, actually, f3 isn't played, and that's that's a little bit interesting. But you've got to consider here that if the knight retreats, black might be later playing for e5, and might expose this potentially as sli slightly vulnerable, the e-file generally. We see a much more solid uh, move instead of f3. But en engines actually like f3 here. I mean, it looks as though it's a natural forcing move to play in some respects, and we can support c4. This looks good as well. Uh, is black really playing for e5 here? Because this surely would liberate the dark square bishop anyway. Uh, e4 here apparently is is an idea, and this is very nice for white actually. So maybe maybe, maybe this is an idea. Just f3. It looks quite aggressive to do this, but we see actually queen e2, more humble looking move. It is attacking uh, the pawn here. Okay, so how does black want to defend that? If he plays g6, he's creating even more dark square weaknesses, which you'd think, in theory, this bishop would would lap up later. Uh, f3, knight, d6, we can support again the c4 pawn here. 
and this is this is quite pleasant uh, for white. Okay, but g6 wasn't played. Instead, we see the, the knight retreating in advance of f3. Okay, but now um, is f3 an idea just to play potentially for e4? It's not played. Again, we see just rook fd1. So the pawn structure here is kept kind of elegantly intact for as long as possible. Whilst many players, I think, would have been tempted for f3 at some point, it's all been left intact. And instead, okay, we see queen c7. And now there might be a concrete, um, aggressive idea of provoking weaknesses in white's camp without the, the knight on f3. h2 is weaker. So knight g4 is a provocative move here, supported by the pawn on h5. That's another advantage. And this is, um, remove this possibility with h3. Okay, and now black now plays rook ad8. From an engine point of view, now, this is at move 20. With, with white to move, it looks as though it's about equal here, uh, actually, as though not much is going on. Are they going to agree a draw or something? Is it going to be a draw? Is is that the reason Mangus has played very cautiously? Um, apparently, um, the day before, Morris Ashley was playing football with Magnus Carlsen, teaching him a thing or two about football, and uh, Magnus was really enjoying himself. Maybe, was he tired? Is, is he just going to get a draw here? Let's see. So, Rook d7. Okay, and now Magnus just plays rook c2, quiet move again. And now queen d8. Okay. So, what is going on here? Or is nothing much going on here? We see now rook c c1 just going back. Is it marking out time? Is it just trying to induce time pressure from black or something? It doesn't look as though it's doing anything. But, um, I think this this is provocative if Gatakamsky is wanting to play for an attack. I think there's a lesson coming up potentially that um you know quietness is, is okay if it is can be part of a provocation strategy. We see another move which looks quite aggressive h4. But the thing is the double edged sword aspect of h4 is it actually starting to create weaknesses? And do weaknesses breed other weaknesses? If this pawn was attacked from this bishop, like this, is it going to provoke g5 later, for example? Well, we see actually bishop e1 now, and it looks as though the threat is now f3, uh, which, which looks dangerous. We see knight e4, so how does this parry f3? Let's have a quick look here. If f3, knight g3, and this could be a very useful pawn, even though it's, it's doubled, it's against white's king, it's cramping white. Actually, black's doing very nicely here, not with moving the queen. Uh, I don't think this this is that good to move the queen to h4, f4. And what is white looking forward to here? This this looks as though there's a bind against e5. But no, in this position, if queen e1 here, e5 apparently is is very very nice idea. Uh, what can go wrong here? If queen takes g3, d takes, e takes, and black can now either take on d4, but even strong queen takes a5, and it looks as though uh, there's some very nice uh, play for black in this position. Okay. Uh, this this looks so it's in black might actually be slightly better. These, these pawns are a bit vulnerable in the center. So in this position, after f3, um, that looks quite promising for black. But instead, Magnus plays queen g4, and he's kind of trying to breed some more weakness here, weaknesses here in black's camp. And in fact, this pawn um, is is there actually a threat of f3? Uh, to take this pawn, well, we see g5 in advance. So now, if f3, in fact, the the white queen could be trapped here. If f3, I believe, almost trapped, f5 or at least perpetual uh, attack on the queen, maybe like this. I think this is, um, in fact, the queen is getting trapped. Ouch! It looks as though this is a way of getting the queen trapped. Uh, with black now threatening uh, rook g6. So the queen's got to get out of there. Uh, she's got to go in reverse here. 
off the g5 at some point can't can't play f3 anyway but first we see c takes d5 and now the queen is attacked and the queen drops back to f3 and now we see c takes d5 uh, queen f3 is designed against the f5 pawn if e takes i think we can just safely take on f5 here this pawn is protected from the bishop there's no no danger of rook f8 there's check anyway so we see uh, c takes d5 and again this looks visually as though black's doing quite well because uh, for many of us this bishop would seem actually quite passive here on e1 this knight quite aggressive uh, there's even a task a quote about if you have a knight like on on e4 or e5 as white the attack usually plays itself but will that Tartakoa um, quote hold up here in this position it looks as though also this is potentially quite dangerous if supported with g4 we see rook c2 and in fact rook g7 it just seems delightful in in many respects for black uh, to have this position it looks quite a fearsome attacking position visually to give Gatakamski credit it looks very very promising can this really be uh, hijacked in a sort of Petrosian style are there really weaknesses which could rebound um, against black here well we see after rook dc1 Magnus stamping his authority though on the c-file but uh, is that really an exploitable c-file having that um, grip on the c-file there uh, we see knight f6 now and it looks as though uh, g4 is is definitely on the cards could the knight have just remained on e4 with just g4 being played here this looks rather dangerous as well you know if hg starts to look quite dangerous for that f file and um, but on the other hand it's not really entirely clear how black would proceed here so let's just have a look so instead we see knight f6 what is black actually preparing here well the queen actually drops back now uh, to d1 and believe it or not well engines actually like this move a lot queen d1 you might think what is the actual threat here well it looks as though f3 uh, might be on the cards to really discourage g4 a bit more and in fact you know g4 then there'll be bishop takes h4 so the queen has vacated actually just for f3 to be played and also the rook still sees across the second rank potentially this rook's not only attacking down the c file it's also potentially uh, defending and counter-attacking on the G file once F3 is played so the Queen D1 move is rather elegant in many respects supporting F3 getting out of the way on E2 for this connection to G2 so it's here uh, that black goes in for it for G4 so if he doesn't play G4 why well, is actually threatening just F3 and then maybe to put uh, the queen back on e2 once that bishop's observing h4 so we see g4 stamping that out so Gatakamski is going for it against the world number one with the black pieces in what looks to be a rather crude um, manner direct attacking play against the white king but this resource now uh, is played which uh, temporarily um, well it's uh, it looks still rather dangerous for the king visually but on the other hand look at this rook it's dual purpose we see g takes h3 here but then this pawn is dropping so we're still equal on material here and one of the forcing moves do they all uh, backfire on black if h2 check then apparently even even this can be can be taken even this is not dangerous knight g4 check there's actually a technical move king h3 that can be played with advantage to white believe it or not this looks incredibly dangerous for rook h7 but queen e1 and then prove it how does black continue in this position if if knight takes e3 rook c8 
and this starts to really backfire on black uh, this position what does black actually do here is he going to give up the exchange it looks lost here so even even this posi position h2 check even king takes h2 but king h1 is also a good move here and then where is black's attack this is a nasty pin if rook h7 again queen e1 is very very powerful supporting that bishop so from what looked like a really promising attack this bishop now on h4 is very very uh nasty it seems uh Gatikamsky tries king f7 and we see now queen e1 anyway okay and now h takes g2 does Magnus want to just take back on g2 here well actually he invades now with rook c7 so if he had done rook takes g2 let's see rook takes g2 king takes rook g8 check well that possession of the c file is gone here and i think it's not so bad for black here and it's also not so bad for white still this is okay in fact the possession carries on here with queen c3 of that c file but uh, this this might be okay this is surely okay for black this kind of continuation so gt pawn was actually left here magnus plays rook c7 check and this is by far uh, really causing some serious issues now because after rook e7 um, there are two very dangerous forcing moves which black need, needed to, needs to calculate very carefully rook c8 here and also bishop takes f6 all the time because the queen can take the place on that diagonal after bishop takes f6 and in fact it's this forcing move which is chosen bishop takes f6 we have potentially a very dangerous attacking queen now so it looks as though this is a petrosian job uh, petrosian often when he was attacked relished attacks because he would like exploit all the weaknesses those attacks would create uh, you have to ask you know when you do an attack is it actually going to the opponent's king which is the obvious intention or is it actually going to your king the attack and here it's like the attack is going to Kamsky's king at the moment because what is who's a king is weaker here now the outcome of all this g5 stuff h5 stuff it seems black's king safety is worse than white's king safety uh, this is actually quite critical now very critical position this forcing move is played rook c8 queen goes to the d6 and now this horrible looking check king f7 check rook g6 okay and now is black actually threatening anything black might be threatening queen g3 here that might be very very useful for black uh, but this is t time is taken to just extinguish ideas like this with f4 okay now what is white threatening very nasty pin here not just possession of the c file but also the, the back row now what is white actually threatening well maybe it seems one of the main threats is rook here and then maybe taking on g2 in this position getter now plays an interesting move which might be one of the only moves in the position to his great credit um, let's see what he can do here um, okay let's see if for example rook d7 rook h8 is actually uh, it's actually appears to be a forced mate for black here with um, let's see whatever black does it seems to be a forced mate um, if king f6 check let's follow this rook cc8 check check and and uh, it's just scooping up black's position okay so it looks as though uh, this is one of the few moves to just remain in the game that was actually played here after f4 
Uh, white has the menacing threat of rook 1c2. We see queen a3. Okay. Very, very dangerous for the black king. Magnus now plays queen h8. So threatening mate on the spot with queen f8 or rook f8. Threatening mate on the spot. That's prevented with rook g7. Uh, giving the king the g6 square. Okay, we see check rook g6 and again is it going to be a repetition? No. This queen f8 now is, is played, king g6. And in this position, okay, guess what has changed? Guess the weakness of the last move with king g6. If I give you 10 seconds here, can you see what white plays now in the position? How the situation has changed for this next move to be possible and simple and strong? So 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, king takes g2. The king can do this, even if it's the discovered check here, because now it means that these rooks are free for, for attacking black's king, potentially, and coming like this or like this, potentially. This is very, very dangerous now. White's threatening just immediately rook g1 here. Okay, we see rook gf7, check. Sorry, rook g f7, pardon me, not check. But um, in this position, queen d8. Okay, so white's now threatening stuff like rook h1, as well as I think rook g1. These are both dangerous. We see rook h7. So rook h1's out of the question now. Rook g1. So just threatening to move the king with a lethal check here. Check. Check in return. King f6. Now queen g8. Threatening again. A mate in one with queen g6 or rook g6, which will be checkmate. But what of rook h3 check? Well, just rook g3 here. That's taken. Queen takes g3. And white is now threatening rook f8 check. And if rook f7, queen g5 is mate in this position. So this is a very, very serious threat of rook f8 check, uh, which apparently it's, it's, it's just not possible to defend this. Uh, in fact, Ganter Kamsky resigned in this position. If he tries rook d7, check check well the black king's safety is just being shot to pieces really and it's a forced mate so here if forgetting the rook sack let's just go with that queen g7 is mate so for me this this game strikes a little bit of petrosian kind of provocation of the attack but once that that weakness on h4 it looks as though is it going to be an attacking trump card later but it was proven by Magnus that with his rooks on the sea file, they could not only attack, but they could also defend quite elegantly. So, an interesting game. Let's do a quick overview and summary of how that game went. It looks as though the opening play from White was rather insipid, rather unambitious looking, just fixing down a few black pawns on the queen side and allowing black to seemingly play a lot of aggressive moves now on the king side uh, spearheaded by that h5 so here h3 seeing necessary against knight g4 uh, and now things really uh, got crazy after this h4 this is this becomes a target for attacks with bishop e1 and f3 and also queen g4 as we as we saw so queen g4 was chosen here creating even more weaknesses but at this stage you wouldn't think the you wouldn't dream these rooks are going to reverse like this to be so multi talented on the c fold and across the second rank at this stage it looks amazing what they did if you look at this game after how the rooks now rearrange like this controlling that c file 
and uh, black having to play g4 here otherwise f3 is rather strong the queen going to exactly the right location for f3 for rook g2 and rook c8 to be on the cards at the right moment not not here white doesn't want to give up two rooks for the um, queen but in this position this dark square bishop has now come alive as well from being rather passive it's very very useful in that bishop takes f6 idea which helps expose uh, the black king so it seems as though this 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 has rebounded on black rather bad, badly so Tigre and Petrosian I think would be proud of this game okay so this is the final position where black's king is actually the one that's defenseless here okay I hope you enjoyed that comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much